If you would, open your Bibles to the book of John, Gospel according to John. I want us to be spending quite a few weeks on this study of John. In this first sermon, we're simply calling the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. That'll cover verses 1 through 5. I often visit uh, YouTube to listen to various ones speak on various things. Certainly that includes religious matters. And I was listening to a Muslim who was answering questions from uh, other devotees of Islam. And a lady said, since the Quran teaches that we ought to listen to Christ, why don't we listen to Christ? Well, he took what she asked and spent a whole sermon answering it and did a great job of misusing the New Testament. His premise was simply this. Jesus nowhere said he was the Son of God. Nowhere can you find in the New Testament that he said he's the Son of God or anybody else in the New Testament said he was the Son of God. And you must understand that when they speak of Allah, they are speaking of God from the standpoint of one individual. They do not understand the nature of God. They don't understand a thing about it. And to them, when you say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're talking about three gods. So they have no idea of it. But he quoted numerous passages. And yet he left out so many. And that reminded me that, yeah, you can, you can do that. One of the ones that did that was the devil tempting Jesus. He quoted scripture, you know. But he didn't take the totality of what that scripture said or what the scriptures teach to form his views. And he wasn't about to because he was dishonest. He's the father of lies, originated them. But his servants operate the same way. The thing that's interesting is that the whole book of John's written to prove to you that Jesus Christ is deity. That's what John was about. The very purpose of the book is stated in no uncertain terms. At the end of it, in John 20, 30 and 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. That Jesus is the Christ, Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. So it's designed to produce faith, confidence, trust in men that Jesus is the Christ. That he is the Son of God. And what people don't understand, though it's clear when you read the Scriptures, is that when uh, the Jews understood somebody to be the son of somebody, then you made yourself equal to that person. They actually say that toward the end when they're interrogating Christ. Then he made himself equal with God. Well, how can you be equal with God and not be God? And therefore, why did this man, quoting so many Scriptures from the New Testament, miss that? That's what you call, the Bible warns us about it, of handling the Word of God deceitfully. It bothers me a great deal in a lot of things to see people use a lot of Bible, but they don't use all of what the Bible says in its uh, immediate and remote context as it deals with a certain subject, reasoning correctly therefrom, and then drawing the proper conclusion. If I were to read, and you can, and we all have, that you're saved by faith. Most of the denominational world says that means you're saved by faith only. But the same book that says you're saved by faith talks about the need of repenting to save you, the need of confessing one's faith to save you, and the need of being baptized for the remission or forgiveness of sins. Same book teaches one, teaches the others. You have no right to emphasize one of them above the others. You have a responsibility to God, to yourself, and to those you're teaching to show the totality of what's taught. You notice also in this passage, the last part, we would say chapter 20, 31b, the latter part of verse 31. 
that John wrote so we could share the life that comes through such a faith as this book is designed to create in the one who reads it. Notice he's saying that faith is not some sort of leap of faith, the way that's generally defined, meaning that you end with knowledge and that faith goes beyond that, and that it's a, something you can't really prove. That's never taught in the Bible regarding the definition of faith, the faith that saves. Faith is to be formed on the basis of adequate evidence and credible witnesses. God does not ask us to believe in Him or to believe in His Son without evidence, adequate evidence. And we're to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 John 5, verse 21. God does not mind being tested. He does not mind of saying, examine me. The prophets of old would say many times to backsliding Israel and being sarcastic in the saying of it, but it must be that I didn't keep my promises to you. That's the reason you won't serve me. And of course the whole idea was they knew that hadn't happened. They knew God kept every one of his promises. So why were they disobeying God? Well, it's like we said it this morning. They wanted to. So the apostle wrote this book to create faith, confidence, trust, belief, the verb form of faith, in mankind. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And breaking down the book of John as a literary piece, you have what's called a prologue or a preface or an introduction. And that basically covers the first 18 verses of the book of John. And in this introduction, he makes several claims about Jesus. Notice that he refers to Jesus as the Word. The Word. There is a wealth of information that we can form if we will but study the significance of that, that Jesus is called the Word, the eternal Word. We can't cover all of it, but I would emphasize this. That Jesus is the executor of the Father's will. Sometimes we don't realize, although we've talked about the roles of the woman and the wife and the mother and the man, the husband and the father, and the roles of children and what God teaches about us and those roles that we're to perform, and they are assigned to us by deity. But we must understand that God Himself is a God of order. Have you ever asked yourself, why was it that the second person of the Godhead, and not the first or the third, became flesh? Because the second person of the Godhead is the executor of the Father's will. All authority originally inherited in the first person, the Father. But you'll notice, and we'll see more about it as time goes on, that deity executed the will of God through the second person of the Godhead. It was not the assigned role of the Father or the Holy Spirit to become flesh, for they are not executors of the divine will. Christ is. Thus he, His lot was to become flesh. And to be tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin and do the things necessary we talked about this morning in going to the cross, suffering, bleeding, and dying, and so on. So even in the Godhead 3, the one divine essence, only three persons possess that divine essence. And it's, the, and it's without beginning or ending. And we know it by the attributes that come there from, omniscience, omnipotence, and so forth. But there are only three persons that are eternal. And they make up the one divine essence. That's deity. And each person has a role. The Holy Spirit was to reveal the mind of God. And to confirm 
that it is from heaven and not from men by the miracle signs and wonders he gave to men to perform, such as on the day of Pentecost when those things happened, the day the church began. So there's the eternal word. Consider with me these five verses. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, how can you read that and say the Bible nowhere says that Jesus Christ is God? Well, you say, but that's the Word. Read verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, who is that? But Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the eternal Word, tabernacling in the flesh. Then notice the same was in the beginning with God. Now, how are you going to be in the beginning with God and not be God? Because everything else, angels included, was created by God. And look here. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So Jesus is referred to as the Word. And it's clear from these verses all the way through verse 18 that the Holy Spirit through the Apostle John talks about the pre-existence of Christ. And we do ourselves a disservice when we only think of Jesus as He was on earth from His birth. There's the pre-existence of Christ before there was flesh. Notice that John's first claim pertains then to the pre-existence of the anointed one. The eternal word. So he existed long before he was born of Mary, John 1, 1 and 2. And thus, his work in the beginning has great significance to all of us. If you look at verses 3 through 5, all things were made by him. About him was not anything made that was made. That's pretty significant to me. So that means... I'm a product of the mind of God, and so are you. I have a role to perform. There's a reason I'm here in the flesh on earth in time and space. There's a purpose for this time on earth. The Bible's full of material that says it's not to live here forever because you lost that right when you sinned. Adam and Eve were driven from the garden. The doorway was open for sin to get into the world, which sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. And all have sinned didn't inherit it from Adam like you do your eyes from your parents. But all have sinned. All have transgressed God's will. Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, we're all separated from God. We need a Savior. There must be a reconciliation. And God must remain God in all that that implies. And still save us from our sins. And he still remained a God of justice. And so John, as did Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is setting out the fact that God, who is a God of justice, ordained a way, a way of redeeming us from our sins. And it involved the second person of the Godhead becoming a man, leaving the glory of heaven, as we discussed this morning, and living on this earth, tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. And because he had no sin, he could go to the cross and die on behalf of others. And thus our faith in him, a living, active, obedient faith, allows us to be considered sinless as we obey the gospel and being baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. And the Lord adds us to his spiritual body, the church, Acts 2.47, where he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1.3. And of course, John is not the only one who proclaimed the preexistence of Christ. There are many other scriptures that do the same. And we'll just notice a few here. It was foretold by the Old Testament prophets. Micah prophesied of the preexistence of the Messiah to come. This is one of the beautiful statements concerning Bethlehem. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, 
Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Micah 5 2. We all remember the great Messianic prophet. He talks so much about the Messiah. He's called that. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, where he refers to the king to come as everlasting father. And then Zechariah recorded the Messiah's own promise to come. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. And shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. Zechariah 2, 10 through 11. I stop here and pause regarding the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning Christ. Sometimes, because we don't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, not as much as we probably ought to, I'm quite sure of that, we don't realize how vivid those prophecies are of Christ and that the Jews of Jesus' day were without excuse. Those are the scriptures that were their Bible. They read them regularly. They meditated on them if they were what they ought to be. And yet such passages as this were readily misunderstood. The preexistence of Christ was affirmed by Jesus himself. Concerning himself, Jesus declared that he existed back in time and space when Abraham did. In John 8, verses 56 through 58, Speaking to the Jews, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily. I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And don't let somebody stand up and tell you Jesus never did say he wasn't God. He is the great I am. You'll see that in his prayer shortly before, as we studied this morning, we took our text from one thing he said in that prayer, but shortly before his arrest and then, of course, his crucifixion, notice how he speaks. I have glorified thee on the earth. Now, you know the only way you can glorify God is to do what he told you to do, and the way he told you to do it, and the reason he told you to do it. So what is the Lord saying here? What he said plainly in other places, and we noticed it this morning. I did what you told me to do. I did not shirk it. I was fully obedient. I finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. Now listen to him. With the glory I had with thee before the world was. Then he said, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. John 17, 4 through 5 and verse 24. Now God is love. That means the Father loved the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit loved the Son and the Father. And the Son loved the Father and the Holy Spirit. God is love. They had no need of anything. God has no need of anything. Sometimes I get the idea we think that, well... Uh, you know, he needs me. God doesn't need you. That means it's all the more amazing that he would do what he did to save us. Does that teach you anything about your spirit? How important it is to God? 
For what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, look around you and you see it all around. They, they give uh, little for their soul. In the revelation that Jesus gave to the Apostle John, last book of the Bible, you tell me how this doesn't refer to the deity of Christ. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Revelation 22, 13. Now take that verse alone, but then take all the rest of them with it. And we just touched some of them. And then stand up and boldly say, He never said He was deity. You remember a long time ago when we had our lectureship on uh, Islam, and I've told this two or three times. Some of them came, and the man stood right out there. I can look right where he was standing. And he was very ecumenical. He wanted to let's all get together. And I simply pointed out, do you believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is deity? I hardly got the words out of my mouth. And he said, no, then we can never be one. Never religiously can be we one. There's no way in the world that anybody that is following the Bible rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2.15, can be one with Islam. No Christian, as that term is defined and used in the Bible, can be one with Islam. First of all, they don't even believe in the God of the Bible. Next of all, they deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. To be son of means to make yourself equal with. John 8, 24. Here we are in John again. To the Jews, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Well, that seems to me that would cover anybody that would not believe in Jesus. Jesus himself declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, that covers those in Islam too, doesn't it? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. The apostles themselves declared of the preexistence of Christ. We have already seen uh, verses 1 through 4 declaring that as John begins his book. And before anybody's going to be interested in the plan of salvation, in the first century in particular, but really it's that way always, we don't have a proper concept of God and His Son Jesus Christ. Then they went out to preach Christ and Him crucified. Thus they had to establish the fact that Jesus Christ is deity. For anything else mattered. That was the belief that John talked about when Jesus said or recorded that Jesus said, John 8, 24, that except you believe that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. When you look at Paul's writings, he wrote the same to the church of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, listen to what he says. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, did all eat the same spiritual meat. Now listen. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That's where we find out why Moses got himself in trouble by violating the type when he struck the rock when he should have spoken to it. He disobeyed God, but he violated a type because Christ never would violate God's will. That's when we learned that all of that was a type of the Christ to come. Right here, the Holy Spirit who wrote and recorded everything in the Old Testament about that said, here it is. That rock was Christ. You have the same thing going on uh, in the second letter to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 8, and verse 9. For ye know the grace, the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 
it ties into what we said this morning. But then we turn over to his letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery or thing to be held unto and grasp, to be equal with God. What does that tell you about the apostles' preaching? That Jesus Christ of Nazareth was equal with God, but made himself. He's the executor of the Father's will. It's his will to come to earth. So he was directly involved in his own tabernacling in the flesh, in the virgin birth. Made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. Was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And you tell me that he does not in the Bible, the New Testament itself does not teach that Christ is deity? In Colossians 1, in verses 16 and 17, for by him were all things created. Could you get plainer than that? He's the executive of the Father's will. By him were all things created. When the scripture says back in Genesis, as Moses recorded it, let there be light. You know who brought light into existence out of nothing? Exactly what well, God did. But specifically what person of the Godhead? Jesus. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Now, when he talks about invisible, he means spiritual matters. Philosophers call it metaphysical. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He's before all things. And by Him all things consist. Now what's interesting is this is where you have verse 18. And He is the head of the church or the body. The church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You know what that's saying? If he created all these other things, as the executives of the Father's will, he created the church, which makes him head of it. And he purchased it with his own blood. Those are amazing things, and I'm sure you that you can milk that for a whole lot more than what we're able to do at this hour when it comes to the implications as well as the explicit teaching of the rest of the New Testament on this matter. But not only that, but the very creation declares the same thing. We've already mentioned John 1, 3. All things were created by Jesus. But the next verses are some of my favorite from the beauty, and they're beautiful to me, not only in the word structure, but because of the message, the information they, they lay out there. And that's in the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. That's interesting the writer of Hebrews writing to Jews who were Christians, but in persecution, they were thinking about leaving, going back under the law. He begins by saying, you're going back under an inferior product that's already fulfilled what God intended it to do. It's already been a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. Now, if you're to Christ and you know the gospel, you've been baptized to Christ, you're Christians, you're reconciled to God, you're justified in God's sight, you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, why depart from all of that and go back? Because there's not going to be another period of time in which God extends grace and mercy to you. There's the point. Necessitating his existence before creation. 
is an important point to keep in mind. Colossians 1, 16 through 19, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities of power, all things were created by Him and for Him, and He's before all things, and by Him all things consist, and He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, not some things, but all things, He might have the preeminence. He comes first, for it pleased the Father that in Him should all the fullness dwell. Notice it pleased the Father. Originally all authority inherited in the Father. Now when you get over to 1 Corinthians 15 and he's discussing the matter of the resurrection and the last enemy being destroyed being sin, thus death will be done away with. You learn there that Christ is going to deliver up everything back to the Father. Oh, what will that be like in eternity? We know God basically as he reveals how he saves us. And in the time of probation as we're faithful to Him. But we're seeing God presented here going to be a different way in eternity. Going to be a different situation. Because the salvation time's over. Probation's over. The place of probation's over. Sin is cleared away. The place for the devil and his angels has been taken care of and all who go there. Judgment's passed. Salvation is no more. Because we have a new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And we will be in resurrected bodies like our Lord's. Isn't that amazing? You won't become God, but you're going to have a glorified body just like Jesus has who is God. And that ought to make us be closer to God, be more concerned about certain things than we are. He is deity. Notice also in Romans 1.20 where God discusses the Gentiles' departure from God, desiring not to retain God in their knowledge. He gave them up and they did all these heinous things that people still do. But notice we usually apply this to the existence of deity. But God is Christ and Christ is God. Jesus is deity. So this applies to Jesus, not just to the Father. Here's what he says. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You realize that's not talking about just the Father and the Holy Spirit. That's talking about Jesus Christ too. These are profound and astounding claims regarding Jesus. But if they're not true, they would be the rankest of blasphemy. However, they are true. And John's gospel was written to prove the pre-existence of Jesus Christ, that he is deity. Consider the significance of the pre-existence of Christ. I say he is deity. This is the conclusion that we must draw when we consider the nature of our Lord's pre-existence. Notice Micah 5.2. His going forth were from everlasting. John 8, 58. Exodus 3, 13 and 14. He is the eternal I am. All that's made clear in verses 1 and 2 of this part of the prologue or the foreword of the book of John. He was, notice how John says it, with deity or God. And that implies a personal communion with God. He was God, explicitly stating His deity. Thus, Jesus is worthy of our love and adoration, and our worship, and everything we can devote to Him with full assurance of the truthfulness of the same. And thus, what can we do but what Thomas did after receiving adequate evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one crucified and the one buried, had been raised from the dead, we can only fall down before him with Thomas saying, My Lord and my God, John 20, verse 28. And woe be to the people who will handle the word deceitfully and conclude otherwise. He, Jesus, is life. He's life by the very virtue of being the creator and the sustainer of life. 
Remember, all things were made by him, Colossians 1, 16. All things are glued together, held together by him, Colossians 1, 17. And again, the apostle John, by inspiration, makes clear in this prologue of John 1, 3 through 4, that without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life itself. Thus, Jesus gives us hope for our own resurrection, John 5, 21 and 11, 25. So Paul reasoned accordingly. Listen to him as he deals with problems in the church at Corinth regarding error on the resurrection. We learn so much as he corrects them. Beginning in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul had this to say. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, listen to him reason. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, which means empty or pointless. And your faith also is vain. It's empty and pointless. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, pointless, or worthless. Ye are yet in your sins. And you can go ahead and see him develop that further. But that's his reasoning. We have the expectation of being raised to in a glorified body like Christ now possesses when all of this system is over with. An eternal body fitted for eternity in heaven to be able to walk in the very presence of God and Christ and all of the saints and the holy angels. And that new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. No more sin. No more pain, no more anguish, no more tempting, no more trying. None of the consequences of sin. So he is light. And what a thought that is when you consider Christ as light. You know, truth is many times referred to as light. And that it is contrary to darkness, which is ignorance of the truth. And at one point, we lived in darkness. We lived in the absence of the truth. Where people spend their lives is darkness all too often. Ignorance of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Alienated from the life of God because of their lack of knowledge. Ignorance, however way it comes. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. Paul says that's the way the Gentiles were. They were doing all those wicked things we read about them doing. They're alienated, cut off from the truth of Christ. As the creator and sustainer of life itself, it is Jesus who is uniquely qualified to bring light into the world, John 1 verse 4. And that life is called by John the light of men. He calls for us to believe that we might be sons of light, John 8, 12, or John 12, 35 through 36, because He's the light of life. And He's the only one that offers the light of life, or is the light of life, John 8, 12, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, of the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But sadly... Many resist the life and light Jesus offers. In his days, own people should have recognized him, rejected him, John 1, 5. Many run from him today. They close their ears to the Bible teaching. They find their happiness in the commandments and doctrines of men and human churches. They know also it means that if they truly believe in Christ as deity in his last will and testament, they have to change their lifestyle, John 3, 
verses 19 through 20, and they love their lifestyle. They're not about to do it. But for those willing to come to Jesus on his terms, that's the only way you're going to do it. He, op he offers hope and he offers guidance in this life that will lead you into eternal life. And he's capable of carrying out and fulfilling all of his promises. No wonder then, as we're familiar with this in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, our Lord still says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Indeed, he is no mere man whose existence began when he was born of Mary. But it's like the prophet of old said in Micah 5 2. His goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. And that is the Lord that every true Christian serves faithfully in the Lord's church and does his best to defend the faith once for all delivered to the saints, declares Christ to be that Lord and that Savior and will tolerate no other and will not compromise the truth of God's Word. We need to understand that. And I would say that if you have someone in Islam or some religion that doesn't believe that Christ is deity, that's where we need to begin and point out that such is the case. You cannot claim that the Bible is the Word of God and say that the Bible does not teach that Jesus Christ is not deity. It does teach it. He is the Son of God. He is the one that can save us. And He saves us by obedience to the gospel. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. <laughs> Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him as the Son of God and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, you sin, we confess our sins. And we pray to God that He forgives us. All of that indicates repentance on our part. And if you need to obey the gospel, then why not now? So come to our Lord while we stand and sing.